explore that while they're here at Yale. Uh, next up we have Hanoi. Don't call him by his official name, Lanter, he goes by Hanoi. Hanoi Huntrico. Uh, he is uh, from Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, Hanoi is a senior major in double majoring in applied physics and music. He was what uh, Dean Wilsinski, uh, he spoke about uh, Hanoi as well. And Hanoi has a passion for music, so he was on the uh, GL Jazz Ensemble, played piano, and he was in the pit orchestra for uh, Kiss Me Kate. We had an incredible rendition, I was lucky to be part of it. Two productions by all Yale alumni who came onto campus and they played the entire music to Kiss Me Kate. So no acting, but the people singing up on stage with their live orchestra, it was terrific. I mean, everyone who was walking out of there had this huge smile on their faces, and Hanoi was in the pit orchestra for that. And he also uh, directed an ensemble called Sweet Spot, spelled S-U-I-T-E, because uh, this was for a bunch of musicians from the same suite who played music together all their four years. So uh, he was part of Sweet Spot as well. And his research interests have traversed, but he is our epitome of interdisciplinary research, doing things in different areas. And parents, you might like to hear this. Uh, when he graduates, he actually if he wants to go down to graduate school, but before that, he wants to spend an entire year in Thailand hanging out with his family, taking a gap year, spending time with his family and his siblings, and just catching up, because four years in college is a long time, he's been away from home, so he wants to do that for one year before definitely heading off to graduate school afterwards. So Hanoi's talk is titled, Surrogate Soundboards for Novel Transmission of Instrumental Audio. Hanoi. because my dad proposed to my mom in Hanoi. That's why I'm calling Hanoi. Uh, so my, uh, my presentation is about surrogate soundboards for novel transmission of instrumental audio. And it's a project that combines my two passions for physics and for music. And the motivation for this project was quite simple. So Yale is one of the best places to both study and to experience music. And just yesterday, I don't know if you guys got to go, but uh, I was at the Yale Symphony Orchestra concert. They had a Valentine's Day concert. They all had tickets. They, you guys all had tickets. Great. Because it was beautiful music by Prokofiev, Tchaikovsky, Berlioz. I personally canceled my Valentine's Day to go to this concert. It was the best decision <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, so you have all this beautiful music, all this wonderful music happening at Yale. But what about my friends back home in Thailand? What about my friends back home in Southeast Asia who haven't had this wonderful opportunity to come to the States, to come to Yale and experience all this music? What about the rest of the world? How can we share the wonderful music that's happening here at Yale with the rest of the world? And what, what you're probably telling me to do is, well, you know, the School of Music has uh, sort of like a live streaming. You can go in and you can, all the concerts from Spray Hall are streamed live. So if you guys ever want to tune into those, um, you can. And Go to this website, and then you'd listen to the concert through your speakers, and that's kind of where the problem starts. So let's have a show of hands here. How many of you agree that listening to an instrument through a recording never actually sounds like the instrument being played live in front of you? Exactly. And that was, a pro that was my biggest problem, and that was a problem that I tried to set up to solve. And it all kind of comes down to the fact that when we listen to the recordings, we're listening to the recording through a speaker. And even though the speaker is a very versatile uh, device for reproducing sound, it actually functions in a very different way to an instrument. So just to recap, the speaker works by having a magnet connected to a, um, a membrane that basically just moves in and out like this to, vib um, to vibrate sound. Now, let's contrast that with the way a violin works. So the violin consists of a top plate and a bottom plate. And the top plate has very complicated patterns of vibrations, known as modes of vibrations. In the same way that a string has different modes of vibrations, a violin plate also has different modes of vibrations, but in three dimensions. And you can get a sense of these um, of patterns of vibrations if you sprinkle a little bit of uh, baking soda onto the surface and, have, and play the violin. The baking soda will um, accumulate in positions of antinodes and nodes, you can kind of get a sense of the complicated patterns 
of vibrations on the plate of the violin. When you use a process um, such as interference holography, you can actually see these systems of nodes and antinodes very clearly. And as you know from your physics classes, if you have two systems of, if you have systems of nodes and antinodes together, they kind of function like two point sources. And when you have two point sources, you're going to get constructive and destructive interference. And at higher frequencies, this interference pattern is going to become more pronounced. So directivity becomes really important at higher frequencies. And this means that for a violin, you'll notice that for higher frequencies, 3,300 hertz, for example, is sort of at the top end of um, the violin frequency spectrum, you get a lot of pointy edges, which means that the higher frequencies are very directional versus the lower frequencies at 544 hertz is a lot more omnidirectional. And this is summarized nicely in this diagram where you'll see that lower frequencies from 200 to 500 hertz are very omnidirectional and propagate in all directions, whereas higher frequencies going into 2 and 5 kilohertz are very directional. So we have this situation where the violin has a very complicated pattern of vibration on the top plate and the bottom plate, and it's emanating this very complicated um, sphere of sound where directivity is very important. And then you're listening through a speaker, which is kind of just sending sound out all in one direction. Even though the frequency content may be the same, the, the, there is no way that a speaker with a simple cone can recreate the complex vibrations on the surface of a violin and really capture the directivity of the instrument. So the idea I had was, well, is there a way we can combine the best of both worlds? Is there a way that we could preserve the acoustics of the violin body but at the same time have the connectivity and convenience of a speaker. And to set out solving that problem, I had to put on my thinking cap right here. <laughs> um, so my idea was, well, the violin body has no idea what is causing its excitation. All it knows is that it gets an input excitation, it kind of wobbles around a little bit, and then sends out an output, the sound of the violin. And what is important is actually the contact between the body of the violin and the bridge of the violin, and the two feet that are there. And so what I thought was, well, if I just vibrate the bridge in the exact same way that the strings would have done on a real instrument, then would both instruments sound the same? Because I would be introducing the identical vibrations at the identical locations on the body of the instrument. And, um, yeah, so, just give it a listen. This is what it, this is a, so this is a first prototype that I built last semester, which I'm uh, iterating and improving. This is kind of what it sounds like right now. And to give you a sense of what's going on, um, if I remove this whole contraption here and just play for you the sound with nothing. It just sounds like that, and then when you have it on the body of the instrument, it's obviously some kind of interaction going on between the signal that I'm sending here uh, that's being amplified through the body of the violin. And the reason that uh, I came up with this idea was because you can think, the reason that this should work, or is working, we don't really know yet, that's what I'm trying to figure out, <laughs> um, is the fact that you can think of the violin like a system with an input and an output. The violin consists of um, the input being the vibrating string. The vibrating string sends a signal into the bridge of the instrument, which is this component right here. And then the bridge transmits that signal to the body of the instrument, and then you get the sound of the violin. So the way the string works is, oh, oh there we go. So the string, of, a vibrating string, when it is bowed, actually looks like that. And it has what's called a Hemholtz kink that traverses back and forth, which is very different from a pluck string. This means that the signal that you get off of the string on the bridge of the instrument is actually a sawtooth wave. And as you know, when you do a Fourier transform on a sawtooth wave, you're left with a lot of high frequencies at the top. And that's the difference between a pluck string and a bowed string. With bowed strings, you get a lot of high frequencies. This sawtooth wave goes to the bridge of the instrument. And the purpose of the bridge is to mechanically transmit the vibrations that are happening in this plane so that, they, so that they happen in this plane and move the body of the instrument up and down. But the bridge also has its own frequency response and actually acts as a filter. 
This is a frequency response of the bridge, and you see it will amplify certain frequencies and deaden other frequencies, filtering the sawtooth wave. When it gets to the body of the instrument, as we, look, as we saw before, each of the modes of vibrations of the instrument body accounts for different resonance peaks in the frequency spectrum, and in the frequency response. And the body of the instrument also functions as a secondary filter. And so what you get is the way that the violin produces its sound is you get the input waveform, the sawtooth wave from the vibrating tree, <coughs> which goes into the bridge, gets filtered by the bridge, gets filtered by the body, and then you get the output waveform. So, as long as I tap and hack into that signal at the correct location, which in this case is the connection between the bridge and the body of the instrument, then it should sound the same. And the way I do this is I have the live violin, I put a sensor or a transducer onto the bridge of the real violinist, take that signal, and actuate my surrogate violin in the same way with the idea that if both bridges are moving up and down the exact same way, then the same excitation should be going onto the body of the instrument, and both instruments should sound exactly the same with the acoustics of the instrument preserved. And that's really quite exciting because it means that you can have one violinist playing in one country, and you can just tap the signal that's coming off their bridge, send that signal around the world, and then have a system of surrogate soundboards located elsewhere, and you can listen to the, uh, the performance and hear it as though it was being performed live. Um, you can even think more locally, if the state of Connecticut you know, puts a travel ban because there's a blizzard and you can't make it to the School of Music, you can listen to uh, the violin recital in the comfort of your own home. Um, so what exactly is happening? How far are we from realizing this dream? Well, this is where um, some cool signal processing and analysis comes in. So this is the bridge signal uh, that I take off from the real violin. So this is the signal that I tap off from the live violin. And you can see that it looks, kinda, it looks like a sawtooth with some little fuzzy parts to it. And that makes sense because uh, the bridge is filtering the sawtooth wave very slightly. But when we look at the signal, once it now appears again on the surrogate, uh, on the surrogate soundboard, the, the waveform has changed slightly, which tells me that the second um, the, the bridge on my surrogate system is actually not moving up and down in the same way as the real violin. And you can get a sense of this by looking at uh, the frequency spectrum. So this is the frequency spectrum for the real bridge. It's got frequency down here and relative amplitude normalized to zero dB on the left. These are the spectral components of the signal that I get in the real bridge. And if we compare that to the surrogate system, uh, the fundamental kind of stays the same, but you notice that a lot of these peaks have shifted which tells me that my system here, although it sounds to the naked ear like it sounds like a violin, actually what's happening is the, the, the surrogate system is not behaving exactly the way I want it to because I want these two to be exactly the same because I want the two bridges to be moving up and down the same way. But um, knowing both the input and the output signals here is what I need because um, I need to find what's called a transfer function. And the transfer function is literally just defined um, as the output over the input. And you, when you know the transfer function, you can implement an inverse filter that sits in between these signals so that when the signal appears again on the surrogate system, these two signals will become identical. And also, the second iteration that I'm working on right now will feature two independently actuated um, feet because right now the entire, feet, the entire bridge is just moving up and down like this one. Actually, the bridge is a, little bit like a da uh, is a little bit like a dancing person where both feet can kind of move up and down like this. And, Take around. Um, so that's currently what I'm working on, and i um, been doing some 3D prototyping. So here is a prototype of the current bridge that I'm working on. Um, so it has the two actuators here, um, and it's a little bit big and fat like this, a lot fatter than a normal bridge, uh, just because I'm trying to integrate the amplification and also trying to integrate the filtering into this one device that literally you just plop onto um, the violin. And so some applications, so we kind of alluded to some of these applications. You can do teleconcerts um, for string quartets, and if you're ambitious enough, you could even do it for an orchestra. Um, you could achieve what's a, called like a one-person string section, because you could just have one violinist play into 20 different bodies. And this will unsettle a lot of violinists, because it would put them out of jobs. But <laughs> as, I, as, I always, as I always respond to, to that problem, um, I'm a pianist, so it doesn't really bother me, because there's one of me anyway. <laughs> Um, it could revolutionize the audio industry because what this allows uh, audio engineers to do is as long as you have the signal from the bridge of the real violinist, you can just play that signal back into the violin 
as many times as you want and change the position of your microphone as many times as you want without having to pay the violinist for a week of recording sessions, which is also bad for violinists, but again. <laughs> so, um, I think that it will also open a lot of cool artistic projects for musicians who feel that speakers are very limiting and that they want to work with actual instruments and have the feeling and the sound and the directivity of a real instrument. Um, I think there will be some very interesting uses in the artistic community for uh, innovative performances and compositions. And um, this project wouldn't have been possible without uh, Professor Roman Kutz, who's been my mentor and advisor throughout this whole um, project. He's in electrical engineering. Um, do Dr. Lawrence Wyland, who you might have met in the CID, but he was the guy who was helping with all the acoustics and the fabrication and 3D printing and iterative design. Um, the Frankie Fellowship in Humanities and Sciences, which pretty much funded this entire project. And uh, Professor Del Stone in Applied Physics. Um, and if you, any of these things that I've talked about today really spark your interest, well, you guys should know that there's a new class at Yale that was started last semester, which is an awesome class called Musical Acoustics and Instrument Design. And it's cross-listed in the engineering and music department and is taught by Professor Lawrence Weiland, who was my advisor for co-advisor for this project, and Conrad Katzmarek, who's my uh, music composition uh, professor in the music department. And it is an amazing class that combines acoustics, electrical engineering, computer science, and musical composition into one really integrated interdisciplinary class. Um, and I had, I had the chance to be like an undergrad here for this class last semester. It was really awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess we move on to questions. And if you guys are interested in these projects or my music, um, feel free to visit. I uh, have it all uploaded on my website. Yes, so um, yes, it is, it is possible to do that. Um, that would require you to synthesize a signal and to synthesize the same signal that, you, you would have to synthesize a signal that you would have gotten in the bridge of the instrument. And it is possible to do that. That would form a whole new sort of like area of, area of research in itself to synth because the synthesis of that signal is like, you know, people spend like years just like synthesizing the right signal. So for me, um, I, I was interested in just tapping off the signal um, from, a, from a real violinist. But yes, it is possible if you were to be able to synthesize a signal that was in the bridge, it would, sound, it would te theoretically sound the same. Yes? Can you experiment with different types of violins, especially older violins that may not have the same acoustic properties as modern violins? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that, that's a really interesting question. So a lot, of people have, um, a lot of people have asked, like, what about the wood of the violin? Because the wood of the violin that I'm using will change the, the, um, the the output of, of what I get, no matter what signal I put in. Um, that's the interesting part. So yes, I have tried with different violins. And the interesting question that arises from that is, now that I'm in complete control of the signal that's in the bridge before it goes into the violin, there's a chance that I can actually, let's say, hey, there's not enough high end. Why don't I just boost the high end a little bit and almost kind of tune the instrument in a way that is impossible if it was a completely acoustic instrument? Theoretically, there is, it, I, I am grossly simplifying a lot of things, but that would be the idea. That would be the idea. Um, of course, there, there, there are, you cannot account for all the mechanical deficiencies of a system through electrical means, but you can approximate it pretty, pretty closely. You know, maybe we'll take one question. You'll stick around for questions. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be around. around. You can even come in and, like, I don't know, play around, touch it, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, so, so, um, so basically, yes, so I am, I am introducing a new system onto the, onto the uh, bridge of the instrument. And, but the point is, um, if you characterize the system well enough and understand its resonances, you know its uh, frequency response, 
then you can account for these in the signal and filter the signal accordingly so that when the sound goes through that system, it's like the system never existed. So that's sort of what I'm working on right now, trying to characterize and really understand what's going on. This was more just to prove that if I have an uh, actuator on the bridge putting sound into a violin, it will make something that sounds like a violin, um, and hopefully it will sound like a violin, sound even closer to it. Yeah. All right, good night. We'll do some questions.